I don't know. Are you on? Check. Oh, play. Play would be helpful. <laughs> Ew, are we matching up now? Let's Just hope aligning so. our technology. So if anybody is here. Did you just chat and say everybody to refresh the page? Let's have some nice picture of daffodils while we're waiting for everybody to join. So should I refresh my page too? Yeah, try it. No, I have to enter it all over again. Go into the handmade apothecary and just open the link. Oh, no. Okay, I made it with you live. There's a finger, I see a finger. That must be your finger. Oh no. What did you do? No, oh, you just see your finger. <laughs> no, I think, what? I can only get in, get yeah. 18 seconds, it's not live. Yeah, I think maybe what I need to do is go back in and just give everybody the new link. It'll only be a minute. Try, try, try. To, to post the new link, because there's a new link happening. Ooh. Okay, I think people can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, I think people can hear me. Right, can I you hear me? Right, we're gonna start. Managed it. Right, show you the garden now. Um, thank you for being patient. Somehow the last version ended and I think people are sitting here in the link, in the same link. Um, but it either needed, the page needs to be fresh. So hopefully most people have managed to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the picture of my pocket for that while I rushed back in and I tried to know, test. Like, squiggly, does that Blair Witch project? <laughs> okay, so here's Ricky. Hi, Hello. Yay, thank oh, you actually, I can. We can do it together. This is the first time we've ever done this, so. Let's see. Who's meant to flip? I know, there right. it is. Here we are. We've managed to work out technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good at that stuff. Um, but it's reversed when I do it that way. Okay, so. Thank you for your patience in setting up this uh, live forage event. Um, we've never done this before. We've just had to work out using YouTube videos of really helpful people telling us how we might be able to do it. Thank you so much for following us. We made it to a thousand followers. YouTube still haven't really allowed us to do live events yet, even though we meet the eligibility, but luckily we found a great app. So we're using an app that somehow does let us do it. So um, we're gonna show you around Queenswood Cafe Garden, which is Vicky's, Vicky's garden. garden, where she works as a community gardener, and then around the woods nearby, so some like seasonal herbs. Okay, so flip the camera. Yeah, flip, flip, flip it. All so right, so this see. is our little community garden. Everything's still under cover from to protect the brassicas from birds. They love to eat our cabbages, um, and we're actually standing right in a little patch of something very nice and very tasty and also very medicinal so but before you start vicky i'll just say to people safety. no oh. first before that oh. um we are going to take questions but because we're talking to you at the moment we can't see them 
But when we move from the garden to the woods, we'll have a little look at what questions have been put up and we'll try and answer as many as possible. But yeah, if you could just refrain from chatting too much in the sidebar so that we can actually see the questions without having to hunt for them, that would be really fantastic. Um, but we will catch up with your questions in between the two locations and at the end. So if you have any questions, do ask them in the chat on the side. But now Vicky's going to tell you all about oh, but first safety. I have to do boring stuff. Yeah, I'm going to move your head so it hides that blue barrel. Safety. So, um, just as a little disclaimer, none of this is um, meant as medical advice for anyone. Uh, if you do have a medical condition, please go and see a doctor or a medical practitioner, her medical herbalist would do. Um, also, really, really, really be careful of your IDs. We say this at the beginning of every walk. Um, be very, very careful with your IDs. If you don't know what it is, never put it in your mouth. Um, make sure you get a good ID book and get really, really familiar with the plants around you. But this is a little taster of stuff that you can start looking for and start to try to identify um, this February. Um, otherwise, there's lots of other things about health and safety on our website, about where you should pick from and where you shouldn't pick from. There's also legality issues. So please, please do be aware of all that. And this is just a kind of visual guide to get you guys started on a possible forage in the future. Um, so, because it's a, a short walk, I'll, without further ado, I'll start on a lovely patch of two lovely edible and medicinal plants. Um, they're still very small because we had that little patch of frozen weather um, But this is a favorite of many people. Do you want to zoom in? I wonder if anyone can guess what it is It's a very leafy looking leaf um, It's not an incredible um, It's not something that you can necessarily tell Is something useful because it just looks like a little leaf. This is wild garlic or also known as ransoms and the latin name is allium ursinum allium ursinum that means bear right yep. bear garlic it's bear garlic it's bear, bear garlic we are in london after all um and it's got a lovely garlicky smell let's should we turn ourselves around again also oh there's a bit of palm <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, there's my finger. Oh, there's my finger. This lovely little, very plain old leafy looking leaf is very small right now and it smells divine. So you break it, give it a sniff. If it smells like garlic, it probably is wild garlic. We have some pickled wild garlic root, uh, seeds. These are the, um, what are they called again when the, when the little bulbs start on top of the plant? Bull bills. Bull bills. These are little bull bills of um, Allium par paradoxum. So there's a different type of wild garlic, but I'm just going to show you that you can, in fact, dig up the roots of wild garlic. Am I in there? Yep. God, we're great cameramen. While she is digging it up, I want to say that actually, you know, it is illegal to dig up in anything. the public to dig up any roots from the uh, yeah from the ground, obviously. But we're in our own garden, so we're allowed to. So. Um, you know, if you know somebody that's got wild garlic and you, you have a plant pot or something on a, a windowsill or you have a garden, then you can grow it yourself to dig up the bulbs. But out in the wild, you'd just be looking to harvest the leaves only. But, but she's just doing it to show you. I mean, we rarely do this. We just use the leaves. We don't need to use the bulbs. There's no need. Um, these are actually still pretty small formed bulbs. They do get... Oh, way! They do get bigger. Oh, it's the wrong way. How confusing. I know, that's why it's... They do get bigger, um, but they taste... They're much stronger. The roots taste much stronger than the leaf. Um, more like our kind of culinary uh, garlic that you'll find in the supermarket. There it is. So that, it always, oh, so identification. We're so excited that we're not actually doing things in order we normally do it in. So identification features of wild garlic are, they tend to grow in clumps. So they tend to grow in patches. It's very, very new wild garlic. So you're not seeing a huge amount of it, but there's across the road, there is an absolute huge field of it. And when you find one, you normally find loads and loads and loads. So leafy looking leaf. Very, very papery leaf as well. It's very, very fine and quite see-through look. Easy to like damage. Okay. Um, and it smells like garlic. Yeah. What lookalikes are there, so Kim? There are, could you open that please? There are some lookalikes. I mean, at this time of year, you're gonna be at what, looking out for things like, let me just flip this in to, oh, it's because my finger's in the way. This is a disaster. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, lots of like snowdrops, daffodils. Um, what is this, Vicky? What's this one? They're tulip. Ah, tulip leaves. That's why I don't know it because I'm only really yeah, good at wild, wild British plants. So this, this is a tulip. tulip. 
Um, which, so in Gar, I mean, you wouldn't get tulips in the woods, but you would get things like bluebells and uh, snowdrops and stuff like that. Um, but they are different, slightly different shaped leaves. You've just got to get your eye in, really. And and when you are foraging, just smell it and forage slowly. You know, because sometimes it might be growing in amongst things. So you just really want to be conscious about every single leaf. You every pick. single leaf, because Kim, why? What's a really, really so, familiar looking? So one thing that you will come across in the wild is arum. This is Arum Italicum, which is, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very particular shaped leaf, right? Aww. Now this is kind of a, well, th this does grow in the wild. It's got a very ad arrow shaped leaf. You see the bottom where the leaf stem is, the leaves flip backwards. This one's got a lot of white splotches on it, but actually you have also the other species which doesn't have so much white splotches. And this often is found growing with wild garlic and you don't want to accidentally eat this because it's really painful to eat and it could be toxic in large amounts but you just painful out. yeah it's got like tiny little crystals oh acid in, now which this is are not really the... so painful for you for your throat and your mouth that you wouldn't be able to eat a lot but basically it is toxic oh so you want to avoid it when you're picking the uh, thing garlic. is right now it doesn't look so similar to wild garlic but when this is at its bud stage when it's very very small so look, it, a little leaf. it does it can really resemble and it's actually one of the most common things that people mistake for it um it's just because right now they're a bit bit large you know like if you weren't paying grabbing handfuls and grabbing yeah handfuls, you might get that Especially and they because, always grow alongside each other and and you know this one the other, one of the species doesn't have white spots on them. I mean, this one's quite easy to identify because it's got like veins. white veins. Um, but yeah, just avoid accidentally poisoning yourself. This is why you really <laughs> have to be paying attention when you're foraging. Like, be involved with your. Um, Sorry about that pump in the background. That's my <laughs> aquaponic system <laughs> making a nice bit of racket. Yeah, you've got to be really involved. Well, make sure you're using all your senses and paying attention. We've got another type of wild garlic for you. Or at least Ooh. it's in the. Allium family. So this, lovely. This is actually my favourite wild garlic. It's not ransom as much. Most people go looking for ransom. That is their thing. But for me, it's this. This is three-cornered leek, or Allium triquestum. Triquetrum. I can never say it. Triquetrum. Right, you hold it, and I'll try to focus on it. So can you see? Should I get my knife out? Can you see? You can see it. Right. Three-cornered leek, called because it has a triangular cross section I'm going to make it nice and clean with me with me mushroom knife is that the knife Lula ate that's the knife Lula ate <laughs> so you can see that it has a nice triangular cross section hence the name three cornered leek yeah, so it's like three points on it um, and it's really nice and juicy it's almost like a kind of cactus or a succulent uh, and it's got a really nice texture to it it smells and tastes like a mix of garlic and leek and the flowers, which are not quite out yet, but they will be in the next month or so, are like little tiny white bluebells with a green vein that runs down um, the side. And they taste like heaven. They taste like cucumber with a really not nice little hint of like floral onion, basically. Lovely in salads. And the other great thing about them is they are an invasive species. So you're not allowed to dig up roots, you still need to get permission, but most places don't mind you digging this up because it's an invasive species. So if you ask permission, someone's going to say, yeah, get rid of it, like brambles, like nettles. So it's basically a weed. Once you've got it in your garden, you will not get rid of it. And I'm happy, really happy about that. It makes great pestos. The, the answer is, eat your way through your problems. Eat the weeds. Eat the nice and chunky, nice and... Um, I love the like gooiness of it. Really, really tasty and, in, and abundant. I don't like things that I have to really work for. This is abundant. It's everywhere all over my garden. So and I this one, it. unlike the bear garlic, which we looked at before, which comes out February, March, it starts to go over in April kind of time. This one, it is out all year round, isn't it, Vicky? Pretty much. Pretty much all year round. If we get a really cold snap, sometimes it can go away. Or if it gets too dry, because it's a nice moist plant. But generally speaking, it's around all year round. Yeah, when I like to make... When you make garlic, you often hear about garlic pesto, wild garlic pesto, because it is just such a good way to use wild garlic up but when you use bare garlic it's very very strong and you do need to put other things in it to, to kind of water it down but this one like is onion. so mild mm -hmm. it you can make it on its own and it, i call it garlic amoli because it almost tastes like it's got avocados it in it's like really creamy 
and the, they're all pretty good in light cooking so if you're like doing a stir fry if you add the leaves at the end you will get that garlic flavor but um if you are going to like they don't do well in like cooking for a long time so if you make it with soup like add it to the end and whiz it up so you get that garlic flavor otherwise it will be cooked down and you will lose the really really good added to your nettle soup garlic goodness yeah it's great add it to nettle soups let's in fact no no we have to do nettles we'll later look at nettles later because it's a good patch over in the woods now we've got another plant over here which is another like it's supposed to be a spring basically for me and i've been waiting for it to come up and i've only got a tiny patch because um people love to weed this garden a bit too much so I like to keep my weeds oh, try to keep it focused. going strong, but people love to come because community garden we have a lot of different people volunteering. People love to weed. So Ooh. this is our lovely cleavers just coming up. Oh, open it up. Oh, oh, you've got a boyfriend. Have I? Or a girlfriend. Oh, oh. Is that what that so means? So some of you might not recognise it, but you probably would have played with that as a kid at school. It's very tiny now, but it grows into really long scrambling plants and kids throw at each other to stick to it i mean i call it sticky willy sticky willy uh, but it's also called goosegrass and cleavers yeah let's swap spaces then i'll go so cleavers gallium aparine is the name we're not even doing things in the normal order we do them in because we're so flustered about the videos but gallium aparine is the latin name and how do we recognize it how does it grow well it tends to sprawl out and this is actually not the best example because it actually gets huge it can get like you know a good few feet off the ground but it needs to support itself by growing and clambering up other things so it tends to grow alongside brambles and nettles where it can use their stems because it's not very strong otherwise it falls to the ground it has these little tiny like palm shaped spiral kind of whorls they're called whorls that form around a kind of squarish stem and it's quite tough in a way it's a juicy plant but it has a certain toughness to it uh oh and it's oh yeah the snap's good but it has these tiny teeny 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 little hairs that become like little hooks and they stick on you that's how you get it to stick to people's backs and wind them up um the other identification feature of this plant, Cleavers gallium aparine, is you know when you have your cat or dog come in from a walk or a play in the garden and they've got tiny little balls stuck in their fur? Well, that's normally the seeds of gallium aparine. They're really, really sticky and they get matted into animal fur and human fur. Um, so, it grows in dark, dank corners of woods and along edges of paths and things and it clambers up other plants. What do we use it for? In herbal medicine, um, we use it as something called a lymphatic. So the lymphatic system runs aside, alongside the blood and is responsible for getting infection and toxins and all kinds of things out of the blood that you don't want anymore. Um, so in the spring, this pops up just in time for us to get our cleanse on. So basically what we do is we make a cold infusion. We do that by taking a handful of the leaves, pounding them up, putting them in cold water I've got to open the phone I'm being instructed to open the phone while I'm talking on a video what am I looking at now there we go all oh, right so you put them in cold water and you let them fuse overnight and then we add a little bit of lemon oh, hello. we add a little bit of lemon and drink that every day um, and it's a really good lymphatic it helps to clear the skin it helps to get toxins out of the body but in folklore it said that if you drink a cold infusion of cleavers every day for 11 weeks you'll be so beautiful that everyone will fall in love with you kim's friend actually did get married on the well she met her her husband on the 11 on the last day of the 11th week ninth week is it nine weeks yeah <laughs> that's good though because it means i have to do it for nine weeks not 11 weeks so if you do it for nine weeks you'll be so beautiful everyone will fall in love with you um and that's because it helps to promote uh, detoxification and, and clarifying the skin so oh and cellulite it's good for cellulite too I wouldn't there's lots of books out there that tell you you can eat it like spinach while that is not dangerous there's no there's not chemicals in it that are, that are harmful for you it's a bit like eating velcro <laughs> uh, it's hairy and it gets stuck in your throat and I really hate it so I don't use it as a spinach unless it's really well blended into like a soup or something and I would eat it when it's this size it's not too bad yeah, but definitely not at all sticky right now. when it gets really large it gets very velcro -y. Mm. and also what family is it in 
The Ruby 8, that was not a test, Vicky. <laughs> you do, I don't remember, I'm not the botanist. It's the Ruby AC family, which is the coffee family. So, and we used to use the you can, you can make cleavers um, seed coffee exactly. Well done, Kim. Yeah, so you get the green unripe seeds, so you don't wait till they've gone brown, you get the green seeds and you roast them. And people have reported it is quite tasty and it has minor, minor amounts of caffeine. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're like a five to ten coffee person a day, it won't give you a hit, but if you're trying to get rid of coffee and you're interested in traditional edible uses, it's, it's worth a try. Some cleavers. Especially if it's so abundant, you just need to run through the bushes with a woolly jumper on. Mind you, you'll have a woolly coffee then. <laughs> okay. Right. So, is there any other herbs you want to look at in the garden? No, but Ruth there? Wright has said, if I handle cleavers, I get a skin rash. Does that mean I can't use it internally? Well... Oh, that's an interesting one. I mean, the thing is, any herbs, my oh. body might be a little bit allergic to any herb at any point. So you should only ever take a little bit the first time. It's probably because you get a rash because uh, of the oh, little hooks. It's just like project. really itchy. I mean, so if you wanted to try it internally, I would recommend just trying a small amount first. And um, trying a small, <laughs> Vicky's walked off in the okay? In the small, a small amount first, because you never know. So we're gonna do primroses and lungwort oh, first, primroses. if you remember, Vicky. There you go. She's forgotten what we're doing. Because, I mean, it's springtime, and I'm going to talk about primroses because we grow them in the garden, but I really wouldn't recommend you pick them in the wild just because you have to be aware of, like, protected plants and plants that are at risk, and people will get angry with you if you see primrose being picked in the wild because they are, like, getting rarer and rarer to find, so grow your own for these ones. Um, they're not very much used in herbal medicine anymore, but while I was abroad last year, I found, like, I started to use a bit more local plants to me and i found that traditionally people used to use the leaves and the flowers a lot and it is do you know what i tried it because it was on my own land and i had lots uh, that had been planted on purpose and i used um both the leaves dried and infused in oil are really fantastic for wounds so often we like rely on calendula seeds because calendula is just a brilliant easy plant to grow and it's a great wound healer and when you ask many many herbalists like us what are your top three skin herbs guarantee 99% of people will say calendula in the top three but I found that primrose leaves worked really really well so infused in oil they make a really good wound salve and Cool Pepper said he was a 17th century herbalist he said he's not found any other herb that will make such a good salve well calendula was cal yeah, Calendula would have been here by then, yeah. But so, but what about Latin name identification medicine? Well, I mean, primroses are really easy to identify because it's, you know, it's one of the few flowers out at this time of year in February. It's got rough ovalish leaves with a white kind of vein down the centre. Slightly hairy underneath. And the flowers, they don't have separate leaves, they're like a little tube. So if you tap on, on the work. A little the flower, tube. Um, no. You'll see. Oh yeah. Oh hello. You no, know, it's a little tube actually. Oh, it's so pretty. It looks like the separate, but they're not. It looks a bit like those Hawaiian flowers, you know, when you get yeah, the big ones yeah, in the bushes. Those... Yeah. I've forgotten what they're called. I've those. forgotten what they're called <laughs> too. Those Hawaiian flowers. But these really nice yellow flowers. These are really nice in teas or tinctures. So I put them in vodka. Um, I've also dried them to make teas, and they're really great for uh, anxiety and nervous tension. And they used to be used a lot for that. They used to be used a lot for nervous hysteria, which is like an old-fashioned term for women's issues um but it's a very oh, good sense for like anxiety mm -hmm. and calming people down but like i said it's a really rare one so don't use it so often and then the other thing that comes out at this time of year is this one which is lungwort which is in the boraginaceae family so this is important because it's one of the first flowers to open as well for bees let's see let this well this, this leaves better all right that's a better leaf so, I mean, they can get a little bit bigger than this. It's a really fuzzy leaf. That whole family has very fuzzy leaves and that whole family includes comfrey, includes borage, and it includes this lungwort. It's got these splotchy white dots on it. And people, in the old days, people used to apply uses of plants to how they looked. And the, they used to think that looked like diseased lungs. I mean, people knew what lungs looked like because people would eat more offal and you know butcher things it's called the doctrine of signatures but if yeah. something looks like something it's to treat that thing so you get a lot of old-fashioned uses based on how the plant looks or it's it was a really good way to how... help people remember things yeah, isn't it, it? Help people remember it's not always it's not scientific it's <laughs> really it is a really good way of remembering things and the ones that have been passed down tended to be the ones that actually work so 
people would use this uh, lungwort for coughs and lung diseases and Vicky, do you want to get close to this flower? I do. Like the family of Boraginaceae, which is all the comforts oh, and stuff. Fingers. Yeah. They tend to have blue flowers that when they're younger, they're pinker. And as they get older, they go bluer. Uh, so they grow in a little stalk like that. Again, they're another tube flower. Really pretty blue. Oh, it's so, so that's blue. just a nice thing to know about. But we don't, herbalists don't really recommend this to be used anymore because this family of plants which include comfrey and include borage they also contain a compound inside them an alkaloid called pyrolizine alkaloids which are potentially hepatotoxic or toxic to the liver they can give you liver damage over long periods of time so herbalists tend to use these externally now so comfrey tends to just be used as a balm lungwort's not used because we've got loads of cough remedies so we don't need to, to to risk ourselves with it but it's really nice to know that these exist out in the springtime in britain because um we then have lots to look at and lots to think about and connect with how people used to use plants so let's go into indeed what about what about this mushroom over here oh yeah let's do a mushroom about this little mushroom right here right Give me your phone unlocked so I can check All questions right. and so then... I just did. I'm doing good stuff. Nice. Oh, you're answering them by text? No, no one answered any questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, well, it's what have we got? What have we got? It's a bit what have you got, Vicky? Of it, but this is kind of the last point in the year where you can find fresh turkey tail. This is not fresh turkey tail. This is so, old. Turkey this is old turkey tail. I've got a bit of fresher stuff in my hand. But you can see how it grows on the branch. So let's turn it around because it's actually better that way. Oh, look, that's a nice that's one. What you be. Oh, look at that blue and green. Wow. So this is turkey tail. Uh, the Latin name, Trimetes versicola. And versicola. I call it versicola. I like it. Like Coca Cola. Like Coca Cola. Um, it's a really, really, really abundant mushroom in the UK and actually most of Europe and probably other parts of the world too but in the UK you will find this everywhere and it completely engulfs logs so it likes dead wood it can grow on living things but it will grow really 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 well on dead wood and it will pretty much grow on anything it's brilliant you can find it growing out of like benches and things and old bits of wood in the garden um, I love robust medicine I love abundant and robust medicine a medicine that's there and available you don't have to go scraping around for one tiny little bit that might be endangered this throws itself at you, which I love. Um, so turkey tail, Trimetes versicola. How does it grow? The reason it's called turkey tail is because it looks like the fanned out turkey's tail. Um, this is a very, very pale example. Let me just grab the colourful one. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, I mean, there is some secondary um, growth on there. That green probably isn't actually the mushroom. It's probably more like a, give me the word, Algae. Kim. Algae, thank you. Um, but see it's almost blue but you do in America especially I've seen pictures of really really blue ones but you get them from rust rust orange brown green blue and more pale like this one and they're all the same mushroom they just take on different colors dependent on different things um, now how do we identify them they look like a turkey's tail they grow in kind of shelves along the log again these ones are very old so they're looking a bit dry and sad but we will find some good examples probably later. Um, another identification feature of turkey tail, and we have some really nice videos on this about the more individualized characteristics, are that on the underside of turkey tail, these are old, so these are getting yellow. This is getting a bit old, it's kind of cream colored, but you should have on a fresh one, a white pore surface. What? Sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. It's so hard with this phone to go the right direction. Um, but you should have on a fresh turkey tail a white pore surface. Yeah, you can really see all the pores on yeah, that. Yeah, can you? Good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, also it should have a visible pore surface, meaning that with the naked eye you can count the pores. So in a, in about a millimetre square, <laughs> just gonna wipe, <laughs> just gonna wipe the screen. Just to, it looks a bit cloudy. I don't know if it's just because my... I think it's the sunshine. I was thinking that earlier. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Um, so in one millimetre squared of turkey tail underside, you should get... Bottom. Turkey tail bottom, you should be seeing quite a few, um, maybe eight oh to ten. Oh my god, I'm sorry for the wonky <laughs> shaking camera. Hey, next time we'll be better. Maybe we'll employ a cameraman. Yeah. We're... Um, 
we will you will Tom, see if the you're pause listening. <laughs> for Tom someone come and help us um, but you will see the pause of the naked eye basically and that will help to distinguish it from other things like false turkey tail which is probably not dangerous but it's not particularly uh, medicinal either and maybe is a little bit toxic we don't know uh, so that's turkey tail one of the most useful mushrooms out there in the UK because it's so abundant and what do we use it for turkey tail contains tons of really cool immune boosting and modulating compounds so they one of the main ones is called uh <laughs> oh substance no substance yeah it is vicky oh wow i was talking about this yesterday when i was teaching it's not k polysaccharide k i think it's polysaccharide yeah I it's think got it's... lots of polysaccharides in it Wow, how did that go from my brain? Better, better glucans. Well, yeah, all, all mushrooms contain beta glucans. This contains loads of beta glucans and polysaccharides. It's called P S K. P S K. Polysaccharide K. <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. We've got a whole blog on it, which I write and I talk about this regularly. But for some reason, in the sunshine today, it's gone from my brain. But it's polysaccharide. What K. herbs are for memory? <laughs> Forgot. Yeah, so turkey tail is really, really good for the immune system, helping to modulate the immune system, and we use it for various immune-related disorders. But we, in, I mean, in Japan, I think it's Japan. It's even um, in some parts of Asia, at least I know, it's um, been approved as a adjuvant therapy alongside chemotherapy. And there's been lots of studies in its use in things like bowel cancer. Not that we're promoting its use for bowel cancer. We're telling you to treat a bit any bowel cancer with that, but definitely definitely good at looking to look what is wrong with my brain today um definitely a good idea to look at some studies about it um psk but what do what do herbalists system. use it for immune anyway? system just general immunity like general immunity it's or... antiviral it's been shown to have some um it can help the body in clearing uh hpv the vi which are well, hpv is formed of hundreds of different types hundreds of different viruses hpv viruses um, and they can actually cause quite a few cancers, so things like cervical cancer, if the body doesn't clear it properly. So it helps to modulate the immune system. There's been studies showing that it can be helpful in HPV and other viral infections. Obviously, so, if you're concerned about anything we've talked about today, do go see a herbalist. Don't just self-treat or anything um, to support treatment rather than self-treating. We're flappy as hell today. Sorry, guys. All right. So, so should we go how, for a would, how would people with? use it? And I also think. You know, somebody's asked the question, could you mistake it for anything else? Yes, we've done that one. We did false turkey tail, remember? You did do that, okay. Yeah, we spoke was... about false turkey tail. So there are some... <laughs> the problem with that question, with identification, is looking at it through my eyes, no. I can't I can't mistake it for anything else, really, because I know it. But everyone's eyes are different. And sometimes you, I could hold up for one person, I could hold up that leaf and that leaf and they'd go but why are they different or you know that maybe that's a bit of an extreme example um but if you've got your eye in and you know plants they become like friends and they become like faces and it's like you can't you wouldn't not recognize your best mate or someone that you went to school with um and it's the same for plants so that the key to identifying your <coughs> wild species is to get out there and look at them as much as you can a good mushroom book a good mushroom book a good plant id book but looking at them as much as you can throughout the growing season seeing where things grow and pop up every every year how many years did it take before you started using what you oh it take, so for mushrooms particularly i would look at a mushroom for at least a year and watch it growing before i would pick it and use it the next year and then maybe it would take three years there are some mushrooms still now that i'm worry about white mushrooms that could be like you know the destroying angel and things so i do i'm really really careful turkey tail the only real look-alike in my opinion is false turkey tail and on false turkey tail it doesn't have visible pores like the turkey tail that i've just showed so it's you. easy to tell like i said we've got a whole blog on this yeah um, so go check so that you out you can go check it out we've got videos and if you're really really interested in mushrooms there are so many mushroom groups on facebook and things that you can join and ask questions and look at other people's photos and i think that's also a really valuable way to to learn as well is just keep looking at different photos and speaking with people about identification they asked about an app but i don't know 
apps aren't terribly good. I think you probably Some of the plant off. apps are getting much better. They are, because the uh, if you can get an app that's actually crowdsourced as an answer rather than a machine-sourced answer. So like sometimes it's like forums where people, experts will identify the plant for you after a few hours Yeah. versus uh, the computer recognition system, which is really rubbish. Because like, I, I mean, had a friend... It can point you in the right direction, but never use that as a, as yeah. a final ID ever, ever. That's ever. a very good point. Yeah, because I had a friend, remember... Um, who asked me, oh, this is uh, this, my app said I've got hawthorn, I'm just going to make a tea with it, can you just confirm? And it wasn't, it was cow parsley, which oh, wow. is not Looks poisonous, but like is I almost identical to hemlock, deadly hemlock. So if she'd picked hemlock, it would have possibly said it was hawthorn as well. But also hawthorn and cow parsley no, like, look nothing alike. It's because alike. she held it up close to the white flower and it got confused, which is ah. why you have to have humans identifying, not computers. But I suppose in 10 years, even computers might be smart enough. I just want to do like a little mushroom confetti. Right, okay, go. <laughs> we'll go into the woods now. Check okay. any. Now is for question time because we're going to have a few minutes walk into the woods Look to at a, this. our this nice spot. Herb, dead herb, garden. Herb patch. Not right Here's now. Herb really patch. Really. I mean, it all looks dead because it's uh, just okay. over winter. RE mushroom app. Okay, Roger Phillips. Yeah, Roger Phillips. Always. Roger Phillips is the best book ever. Should we turn it around on ourselves? You're right in front of the bins. Oh, right in front of the bins. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely go for the Roger Phillips Mushroom book, best book ever. Um, good for memory, thank you. Uh, could do some of that today. There's Ooh. loads, Lemon Balm's also great for memory too. Um, okay, is it better to dry? Oh, yeah. Is it better to dry? Oh, it's super busy here. Let's just, I've got to run. Are we talking here about the uh, mushrooms? Possibly. For mushrooms, is it better to dry or make a tincture? That's a very good question. Uh, polysaccharides are kind of sugars. Um, long chain sugars that are really good for your immune system and they can be normally extracted in water however when you're making a tea from something that's really tough like a mushroom or a bark or a dry berry woody tough structures you have to boil them to get the goodness out so herbalist makes something called a decoction which is um, a boil it's like basically instead of pouring hot water over it you have to also boil it on the stove for like 10 or 15 minutes at least um, so I would make a decoction from my mushrooms if you wanted to tincture them that's a whole process extra um, some compounds in mushrooms do need to be extracted in alcohol this is part of kind of like learning to become an actual herbalist making tinctures because there's a bit of alcohol involved and a lot of chemistry what are you looking at? Did we just pass the elder? Yeah. Do you want to go back to the elder? Let's go back to the elder. It's, it's in a massive pile of mud. Well, it's all right. I've got Wellington boots got on. on. I've got lovely red hair. I do like them. So how do you prep? Wow, sorry, we're in Ooh. a really busy Where wood. Where are you gone? There you are. <laughs> we're in a really busy wood. Um, so, so you'll hear, <laughs> you will hear people some naughty shouting dogs. dogs. <laughs> um, so look at this muddy, can we just get in for you guys? We're walking across this swamp to get in at one of our favourite medicines, actually. Um, should we go round? I'm coming through the swamp as well. Look, look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh look, and we've got um, celandine. This is lesser celandine. Uh, which is, comes out this time of year as well. They're like little sunshines. Um, they used to be used in herbal medicine. What's its other name, Kim? <laughs> its other name is Pilewort. Because Pilewort! If you dig up the roots... What a lovely, lovely name. I'll put back. Also, it's a bit of a weed you can here. see it's got like little lumps. Little I don't lumpy. know if you can quite see that. Wait, but let me zoom in. Remember we talked about the Doctrine of Signatures before? About... Um, things that looked like things were <laughs> referred to so they thought these looked like piles there you go basically hemorrhoids and so they'd make an ointment out of these bulb like these little bulbs root mm, things yum and um and then make a lovely little ointment for your piles <laughs> um in europe people do eat the leaves but they don't do it in britain because the leaves over here are not very tasty and in Europe, they are Sorry, tasty. But Kim, Look what I did for you. What have you done to your hands? I sacrificed myself for the public good. For pile um, one. Sorry, I'll just. No, on you. No. Um, so, yeah, it just seems like the gene type, but like related to the species, well, they're the same species as the European, but they just taste better. So, there's no tradition in Britain of eating them because they taste crap. Um, they grow in really wet, muddy areas, just like this, like by this the one. side of ditches and ponds and uh, muddy 
I'm really sorry, Oak. But what we came here for today, <laughs> really. Is this Elder? Ta-da! So, oh wait, zoomy zooms, tappy tap. There we go, look at that beautiful Elder. Now I'm gonna just show you how it looks as a tree. We're not at the best angle, but it does this really cool oh, thing. See Let's see, Kim. Oh, I see that way. Yep. Zoomy zoom. So this is Elder. This is the bark of Elder. Let's do some ID. So what's the Latin name for Elder, so Kim? Elder is Sambucus nigris. Lovely. Um, because it's called Black Elder. Black so Elder. Red Elder as well, but not and over here. Lovely thick but The older bark. trunk is always rough, but the newer shoots are a bit shinier and smoother, but they have, look at my lovely hands. They have these <laughs> lovely like pimples on. What are they called, Kim? Just pimples. Lentisils. I'm not sure if they are lentils on elders. But oh, for God's sake, all these years we've been calling them lentisils, well, which are breathing apparatus for plants. Yeah, it helps the bark breathe, which happens on more on cherries and apples, but I'm not sure if it is why it happens on elder. Okay, so we're going to call them pimples. Um, so it's like very silvery, shiny bark, and these young shoots really come out straight from the older bark. And they, here you can see it, they kind of like bend over a bit like walking sticks. So they shoot up really strong and long. And then, and then they get too heavy out. for themselves, especially when they start to bear fruit and things. They really, really bend. So this is a, a it's a small tree or large shrub. Sorry, I'm trying to m never get my way around the mud. Maybe just stand still. And... It's a small tree slash large shrub. And it does that characteristic up and then whoop, over kind of bend. Yep. And it's a really handy tree because it likes growing in disturbed wastelands. So it grows really well around humans and hedgerows, but in wastelands and cities. It grows in woodlands as well, but unfortunately, because it's a small tree, it gets overshaded by other trees and therefore you don't get a lot of flowers and fruit on it. So it really is best to find one that's in a hedgerow. Um, Identification. In the 16th century, um, there was a book written on how many different recipes and remedies and illnesses it could be useful because it's a proper like first aid kit so it's something that I would really recommend everybody learns to identify um, because it's such a handy plant to and know. how would you identify it Kim? So we've identified it through the bark I mean it's hard to tell now because the leaves are really small but if you were to these leaves will get as big as my hand if not bigger but you can see there's like five and sometimes seven leaflets. So normally an uneven number of leaflets this is one whole leaf but it's deeply, deeply lobed. Tap. It's deeply, deeply lobed. So it looks like it appears it's lots of different leaves, but it's actually one whole leaf. Yeah, so this is one whole leaf. And sometimes you can get five, you can get seven, or you can get nine. And if you crush it and smell it, particularly in spring, it is really resinous and pungent. It almost makes you want to uh. gag. It's really, really <laughs> strong. So it's really we strong. always say when you're foraging, use all your senses, and that's one of them. Um, so if you've got that really pungent, really resinous smelling leaf, then uh, you've probably got elder. I mean, there are identifications of the flower and fruit, but there's no point talking about it now while they're not here. I will well, just talk about the fact that... The flowers do come out and they're white and they kind of are displayed lots of little tiny flowers in like a dish shape on top of a, you know... When they do come out in bush, you know, they have like a white dish of tiny little white flowers, which look a bit like plates being rested in the, in the tree. But I mean, lots of trees have clusters of white flowers, lots of yeah, plants do, this is so you true. really do have to look into it and we have blogs on the identification, there's just very little point talking about it now because it's And then to... the flowers turn into berries, but at this time of year, so there are three stages in the year that we would use elder, leaf stage which is now yep. and as so, Kim said it really really is stinky. Yep, so we've got the leaf stage at this time of year, when they get a bit bigger, um, well, no, when they get a bit, when they've come out fully, they're still really stinking resinous, but before they've flowered, this is the time of year that we're going to use elder for leaves to infuse into oil, and we use that oil on the outside of our bodies. We don't eat it, we only use it externally. Why don't we eat it? Because it will make you throw up. The resin is emetic, and if you eat it, you will throw up. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. used to use that in the old days as a way of getting rid of illnesses. But purging vile it. spirits yes, from purging, the body. Purging your body. But really, it's a really great remedy because of the smell, it can be used in things like um, insect repellent sprays, usually best combined with other essential oils. But I find it's a really fantastic oil ointment. You can make it into a balm with beeswax for, for bruises. Kim had to go to a wedding once and she got all bruised up. Was it on the boat, working on the boat? No, I can't remember, but I she smashed got all my shins really, up. 
with really large bruises and I was slathering this all day and they disappeared within two, three days just in time for the wedding. So I find it a really fantastic external remedy for making balms for bruises. Yeah, and then in, I mean, I have started to see some flowers come out now, like the little buds. So like by March, April Can time. We just so clarify because there's loads of people going Alda, Alda, not Alda. I've yeah, just Elder. written it. Elda with an E, E L. D-E-R, Sambucus nigra. So it's a tree which elderflower comes from. So if you had an elderflower cordial, this is the tree. Elder. Elderflower champagne. Well, elderflower is just referring to the flowers. So if you had elderflower cordial, elderflower champagne, or even elderberries, because uh, that's quite a popular remedy you can buy from the chemist in things called Sambucol, which helps with the immune system. But we're going to do these walks later on in the year, and we'll talk more about that then. Yeah, the moment, seasonal. Seasonal, we look at the leaves, we gather them, and we infuse them into oil. How do you make infused oil? It's on our blog. Um, but you infuse it and then you can make it into bruise balms. And then in a couple of months, the flowers are going to come out and you can smell them. If they smell like elderflowers, then that's another identification. You can make your elderflower cordial coming up. But that's it. That's it. I see you getting about elder. <laughs> because we're at 45 so minutes. That. So we need to go and find. Off into the oh, that is serious swamp material. So we're going to go and see the last two plants. Come on, Vicky. It's just a bit swampy. Ah, oh, where is she? All right. All right, what else questions have we got? Let's have a look. Oh. Okay. Kim, I was at a herb book in Hampstead Heath with you last year. Yay. And you said that elderleaf was like the English equivalent of arnica. That is exactly what we use it for. So arnica, if anyone's familiar with arnica, is a very small flower that grows on mountainsides across Europe and the Americas. And it's massively over harvested because it doesn't really cultivate well. So it grows really well in wild conditions, which means we have to harvest it from the wild. And because it's so small, you have to harvest loads to get enough to make an arnica balm for bruises and stuff. Whereas elder is a tree medicine. So it's massively abundant. Unfortunately, in this wood, it's actually not that abundant. But across little tiny woodlands and edges of gardens and parks, you will find it in sheer abundance. And tree size, you know, you can harvest baskets of it and the tree wouldn't even know. So basically, it's a more sustainable way to, uh, if, you, if you use arnica, you can use more sustainable things. And I actually prefer to have, um, a, like a, a I'm forage, directing Kim. sorry, it's because somebody was walking. <laughs> A foraged bruise balm made yeah. from daisies, daisies. Which, are com- which are related to arnica and elderleaf and that makes a really fantastic balm and you just pick normal daisies that you make a daisy chain out of and um, infuse, infuse it in oil and make a little balm. This recipe is in our book and I think it might be on the blog somewhere. Right, we're just running up the path to get to our last two plants which are nettle and hawthorn and hazel. Do you semi dry oh, the leaves for infusing? So when we make an infused oil, um, it is a good idea to let the, the bulk of like the moisture out of the plant, but we don't like to fully dry them. So yeah, I'd say we'd pick them and leave them for a few hours or overnight in a warm place. Oh, you have a little doggy. A little because stick. if you mix wet leaves in oil, it'll just go off really. So it's much easier to control your oil quality if you, you know, wilt them overnight or a couple of nights to get rid of any extra mo- excess moisture. But what is important, I find, is to... Oh. So yeah, we're going around here. What I find is important when making um, herb you have to bruise your plant matter. So in a pestle and mortar or with a rolling pin, roll out and kind of crush the cell membranes in the, in the leaf or the flower or whatever you're using so that it will infuse better into the oil. And then we tend to leave the oil either in the sun, if you have it in the UK, like a greenhouse or a sunny windowsill is good, or more likely in the UK, on a radiator. <laughs> and that infuses over a matter of days or weeks, depending on yeah. how much you, how, how strong you want it. You can also double infuse by taking out the first plant matter, nettles. Well, yes, like we said, there's uh, recipes online. On our, I didn't have so. Okay, look at this view. Beauties. This is the perfect time to be starting to pick your nettles now. They're short, they're fresh, they're green, they look yummy. So juicy. So look juicy. at them in the spring sunshine. So lovely. Oh, I do love my nettle. I missed you, nettle. So again, it's funny how nature kind of provides what we need. We saw cleavers earlier. So we saw mushrooms. We saw turkey tail for the immune system that comes up in the winter. By the way, someone did ask, what's the best time to pick turkey tail? I always say between November and February. 
um, I find it's at its best and it's got its thickest, you know, whitest pore surface. So in the winter we've got mushrooms to help our immune system. In the spring, nature pops up with stuff like cleavers to help cleanse out, you know, that all the cobwebs from the winter, get rid of all the cellulite and all the rubbish that we've accumulated by eating loads of carbs and fatty foods. So it's a really good time for cleansing. Nettle is a really, really, really nice nourishing herb and a cleanser as well. In in Chinese herbal medicine, it's used as a blood purifier or blood cleanser, and it's really, really high in blood minerals. So iron and all the things that your blood needs to be healthy. So it's great for people who suffer from anemia. That you can include that into your diet, um, but also people who just want to have nicer, healthier bodies. So it's really good for skin, hair, and nails. Um, the leaf. I mean, I haven't gone straight into an ID with this because most people do know nettle. Um, Urtica dioica is one of the types of nettle we use, but Urtica species in general. Um, and if you're not sure of it, touch it. Exactly. The reason I'm not going to go too much into the idea of it is most people know it, and there is only one thing in the UK that will sting you like nettle does, and it's nettle. So that's how you ID it. I mean, the um, only thing you could confuse it with is like mint species, which have kind of similar, like white dead rough nettle left. As well. They have opposite um, leaves, um, which have got toothed at the edge. A bit like this, uh, which is like white or red dead nettle in the Brit uh, in or hedge woundwort. But basically, nettles don't have flowers that are recognisable as flowers. So if it's got a nice white or pink flower, um, it's not nettle. Basically, and it will sting you. Whereas dead nettles are called dead nettles because they don't sting. Yeah, they're not. So related. it won't sting you. They won't sting you. So oh, nettle is oh is um is lovely stuff because it's really really high in minerals and nutrients. But also for vegans, it's like something like twenty percent protein. So, Chicken's thirty six percent protein. Yeah, so it's really, really high protein for people who don't eat meat or don't or are vegan. Um, this time of year, I mean, medicinally speaking, we use it for such a huge array of things. It's nutritive, so again for anemia and blood things. Um, really, really good for women before their periods to help build up their nutrients so they're not losing so much blood and iron. Um, but main, main, main thing at this time of year, we need to start planning ahead for allergy season. Urtica dioica nettle is really, really, really good for allergies. It, it helps to change that your, the way that your body reacts to histamine because it contains histamine in itself. So it can help to prepare your body for the allergy season. But you must, must, must start taking your allergy herbs way before hay fever season starts to get your body used to it. So um, we make a lovely tea, nettle tea for allergies. Allergies of all kind, by the way. But also we love putting it into foods for like soup and stews and this is one you can use as a spinach placement however i would recommend blanching it and blending it yeah because the stings can can get you sometimes it's definitely a food you need to cook unless you're really brave um you can i mean people do make nettle pe pestos but you have to be really really good Blend at blending it, really it well. because all you need is one sting to ruin your day in your mouth um <laughs> and you, so tea wise you can use the leaves fresh can't you vicky yeah but you can also pick them and they dry very well um, you just leave them, I mean we just have a table and you put out a kitchen towel and, and spread them out so they're not really overlapping and touching, you just leave them to dry, they're a really easy one to dry and what, which one you, what you're going to pick is not the whole plant but just the top. The See top. Kim's brave, look at her herbal fact, hands, all muddy and nettly. You know, I pick like the top two, four, six, eight leaves, Yep. even when they get a bit bigger. You just leave the lower leaves because they're old. Um, as they get older, the and they get muddy. Come out the top and they get old and muddy. And you just there's two times of year you can pick these. There's now in the spring, you know, when they get fairly high, they will get bigger than this. You can still pick the tops. Um, and then if they get cut back, and they have a second flush in autumn as the leaves fall off the trees, they'll kind of shoot up again and you can get these young fresh shoots. So it's these fresh young shoots we're getting during the summertime. They grow really tall, they get they go into flower, and at that point, when they have flowers, which basically look like little dangly green... <gasps> we can show them on the... Look, they look like hazel flowers a bit, don't they? Uh, I suppose a little bit. Dangly um, dangly. They dangle down, so they would be dangling down in between where the leaf meets the stem. A little bit like having dangly things from your armpits. Once it's got to that stage, traditionally we don't harvest them anymore because they have crystals in them which are a bit tough to diet. diet to flush out of the body so they could theoretically give you back pain or kidney pain, irritate your kidneys, so just keep to the fresh young shoots. So from um, a gardener or forager's perspective, like Kim said, 
The great thing about nettles is if you continually cut them, they'll continually have new growth and they won't flower. So, so you like can keep them perpetually. Yeah. yeah, it's like cutting cut in the salad. You can keep them perpetually green and fresh by keeping your patch well cut and well harvested. Yeah, and so we have recipes online uh, for nettle soup and things like that. So have a little look if you want to find out more about that. Um, yeah, so for, for leaves, just spring and autumn, you can use the seeds in summer, but again, that'll be for another video. We'll talk about that another time. All right, Quickly. I'm going to take a little walk over here, no, trying to not get all the people. We've got a beautiful little thing over here. It's so nice at this time of year. It's so easy to spot in a woodland. Um, this is a hazel tree. Sorry, sorry, I was just zoomed right into the flower. This all is right. a really hazel tree, and you've got these catkins on here, the yellowish, the, the male ones, and they've got the most beautiful female flowers. So, ah, oh, I just knocked off the male one. So you can see there's a male here, wait, so wait, tap. Wait. Zoomy zoom. Yeah, there's the male one. Beautiful, dangly And flowers. then here, the what looks like, well, it is leaf bud. Right at the tip of the leaf bud. Look mm -hmm. at the state of my nails in that mud. Oh, lovely. You can see this beautiful crimson hazel flower. It's, it's so, so tiny. It's so pretty and so vibrant, but people overlook it because, you know, they you just don't notice it. can be brighter coloured than that, can't they? They can be like, mar uh, like maroon coloured as well. It. We don't really use hazel for much i mean uh, traditionally the nuts were using like nut milk gruels for convalescence for people recovering from illness because it's so high in proteins and fats and low in carbs and um, that it would really help rebuild the body but otherwise it's not terribly as much in herbal medicine Do you know so, what? so but hazel yeah hazel so we've done really good it's actually 55 minutes that's in that's good then what we want to do then is go back to that hawthorn and talk about hawthorn because that's another great one that's coming out this time of year. My, someone said, my friend loves immersing himself in nettles. He says it's good for circulation. Do you mean like literally rolling in them? Because that's fun. I mean, there is a traditional therapy called urtication, which mm. is where people hit themselves with nettles because it encourages circulation. Uh, there has been there have been studies with people with arthritis who do it and say they they find it reduces symptoms and pain and swelling mm -hmm. so it is something people do but you know it's not it's, pleasant it's something that people would have to be really into to do i it wouldn't mind those it. people you know those people who love a bit of pain they love like a bit of tattooing or something <laughs> it might be for those kind of people I, who are like oh i, love I a enjoy bit of... nettle stings because they don't hurt me but they do hurt you and i think everyone's really got, i get welts everyone gets different reactions to different plants because we're all built differently have different receptors in our skin and so when i have them it just feels like a nice itchy burny but for vicky a nice itchy burny yeah, i like, love a bit of itchy burny it's in the just morning. like when you scratch yourself and you get that kind of satisfying Ugh. itch i Whereas get massive welts vicky on my gets hands welts, but i just think it's because vicky is a wuss i'm a gardener i'm well strong <laughs> i'm northern and tough I'm, <laughs> I'm northern. and i can take nettle stings what are you, what when we, I were a kid, are you naughty? You just got thrown in the nettle patch. No, we're not, we're not going not really. To Hawthorne. Yeah, we're just going to the Hawthorne. Oh, lovely! We're going to Hawthorne now. Um, we do need a better camera system, don't we? You poor guys just getting blobbed around <laughs> and kids screaming and well, dogs everywhere. It's either that or you don't get anything. This is at all. what we do right now. Yeah. Oh, so, look, turkey tail again. See, I told you. Look at that beautiful colour. It's everywhere. Another dry one though. So this is Hawthorne that's starting to come out now in the woods. And there's two types of trees that you'll see kind of coming into bloom at the moment. Well, apart from the elder we showed you, but there's white thorn, which is usually like slow or um, bullis or damsons. And what they do is they put out flowers first and then they put out the leaves. But black thorn, which is hawthorn, they put out the leaves first. So people often ask me this, oh, is this hawthorn flower? And I say, no, because at the moment, the flowering ones, they've got very similar flowers, but they're black thorn, but hawthorn will have Little leaves. Lovely leaves coming out. And in fact, you can see... Let's get a zoom in on that. The little flower buds are coming. Oh, they'll be coming in the next few weeks. I can't wait. I've, I've run out of hawthorn tincture, so I'll definitely be making some hawthorn flowers. So tincture. this is also called May, May thorn or May flower, because the flowers tend to come into... Um, flower? Flower properly, <laughs> or come into a peak in May, the 1st of May. And the May queen, she was dressed in May flowers. We should um, do that this year. We've got a lot more It's really nice. Um, it's got thorns on it because it's called hawthorn, so do watch out for it. Its Latin name is Crotagus, and there's a couple of species in Britain. There's Crotagus monogyna and Crotagus levigata. I don't know which one this is yet. You tell from the flowers and the seeds because monogyna is monogyna, like gyne it's got gynecology, so one female part. So when you get the seed, when you get the flower, it's got one female part, and the seed has one seed, and levigata has two to three, and that's. But they're used interchangeably. We use them the same way, 
And at this at this time of year, what it's best for is eating the leaves and the. I was just flowers. eating leaves, and now I'm gonna feed some to Kim. Oh, she's doing it without her mouth. Okay. Eat it after. I'm doing it without my mouth. Do it about your hands. <laughs> Do it about your hands. Watching the thorns, you can eat it straight off the bush. That was our imagine if teacher imagine if say. you lost an eye, and then the story was that you lost your eye by eating hawthorn. Do be careful eating hawthorns off the bush because they are thorny. Yeah, they are thorny. But our teacher used to say like you can only truly appreciate the flavour if you forage like an animal. And Who was teacher? Christopher Headley. Ah, oh, Christopher, of course. So um. They're really tasty, they're really nutty, and it's so nice to have these in salads and things like that. Um, what do herbalists use them for? I mean, for? in the old days, people used to eat these little flower buds in between the leaves, and it used to be called bread and cheese, because it's so filling for kids on the way home from school, they'd eat these bread and cheese. Well, basically, traditionally, the fruits that come in autumn were used, um, and they were like, infused in um, alcohol for heartbreak and grief. And you know what? It's one of the best things I've ever found for heartbreak and grief. Hawthorn and rose for people that have had a loss is really, really nice. And all you do is you put the fruits in the brandy and infuse it for a month. And then you can just sip it. And it's a really nice... And you know what? It's a food. It's, they're basically miniature apples because they're related to apples. So it's like a miniature food. It's just like a tipple, a liqueur, but it also helps you calm. But herbalists tend to focus on the flowers and leaves. So as soon as these flowers start popping open in the next few weeks, you pick them. There's bunches of flowers on here. And what you do is you pick them while half have opened and half of them are still in bud. So when they still look like they're covered in tiny little footballs, you pick the top leaves. So you pick the flower bunches with a couple of the fresh leaves next to them. You put them in a jar or you could dry them to make tea, but they don't taste great. So you put them in a jar and you can put vodka on it. it right. And herbalists would use that again for helping with anxiety. So occasionally you could take a bit for anxiety. So we didn't do but the order. Herbalists would do, uh, use this for cardiovascular disease, like lowering high blood pressure and increasing low blood pressure. But I wouldn't recommend you do that yourself. Do go see a herbalist. Um, so uh, that's how we use it. I'll go in the mud for you. There you go. Kim, you have to get in the mud so this lady can well, cross. There you go, everyone. Nice bit of um, so <laughs> coronavirus times. Actually, because I wanted to do identification, but it wasn't really big enough. I was going to say, we didn't do any ID. So, how do you ID a hawthorn? Again, like an elder, the tree is a small tree or a large shrub. This is quite a big one that's fallen over, actually. The bark tends to be reasonably shiny, but the older bark, oh, sorry, reasonably shiny. Ta-da! But the older bark, gets, just like elder, is a bit more crinkly and wrinkly. So this is the older bark of a, of a hawthorn. And when the leaves come out, they get much bigger than what Kim's got in yeah, her hand they here. Get quite big. But they look like a little meditating person. You can't really see it there. But we say that the the bottom lobes here oh, wait, are the legs being crossed and the little thing at the head. You can't really see it right now. I mean, <laughs> I think for the identification, because it's a bit early to help you identify things, there's a really good blog which I break down the two different species if you want to get really geeky, but how to identify hawthorn. So if you look at the blog and Google Hawthorne the Heart Healer, it has all the identification there for you. So you'll be able to see it because it's such a really well used plant by herbalists and by people because it makes great liqueurs, makes a great anti-anxiety medication and it's used very much for cardiovascular problems like blood pressure. But again, like I said, if you've got any of these concerns health-wise, do go see a herbalist if you want to treat. Okay, so, so we're coming to the we're, end. we've run over time but we did start late. We've just got a couple more questions. Can you use any of the blossoms any of this time of year? I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're referring to. Um, because yes, yeah, so if we're talking about hawthorn blossom. No, it was before hawthorn. So I'm not sure. I think it was about the hazel. We don't really use hazel medicinally. We just wanted to show you it because it was pretty. And then the last question is, do you always make tinctures with fresh herbs or is it okay to use dry herbs too? Well, some herbs have to be dried. So there's one herb called that comes to mind called anemone pulsatilla. And if you don't dry it before you tincture it, it's actually quite toxic. But the large majority of herbs I use fresh. And I think that the life force and the medicine that's made from is much, much better fresh. Um, but saying that, there's a big difference between plants, uh, herbs that you've 
harvested yourself and dried and they're only a couple of months dry versus something you've bought from a shop and may have been there for a year or two you know it's just over time they're going to degrade in quality but that doesn't mean that they don't work so if once you think you really want to make some tincture out of a herb and all you can access is dried in the winter it's fine it's still going to work it's just it might not be as strong exactly um other things do like fresh so cleavers for instance i only make a fresh tea. Make ourselves more central. <laughs> it's central. i do only use cleavers fresh i only use nettles fresh in tincture form you can dry nettle for tea but they're all different the thing is there's no one rule fits all so you have to kind of like really learn get to know and learn it's, it's a it's a process and it's an art um and i know that people want to cut corners but it's all that the journey is the fun point also i'd say don't use an enemy pulsatilla that's just for herbalists to use <laughs> don't don't do it yourself it's quite strong you won't get it anyway uh, no. <laughs> so um what we're trying to show you is like really local herbs that are really abundant really sustainable that are in your local area have uses that kind of cross over from food and medicine so it's hard to you know it's you don't need to worry too much about dosage like hawthorn is a food elders are food um just don't eat any elderly as well because they make you vomit. And the nice thing about the things we've talked about today, like nettle, cleavers and uh -huh. hawthorn and elder, they've got so many uses. You've got entire medical kits. I mean, we could probably do a whole day on elder, a whole day on nettle, a whole day on hawthorn. And you don't need to know every single herb out there. You just need to know a few local ones that you can use for a lot of things. Um, the question about the blossoms was about cherry, plum or apple blossoms. Now, all of those flowers possibly, I mean, Though that the species contains a lot of like uh, cyan cyanogenic glycosides, mm, mm. so the flowers aren't so it's not it, that's all flowers the, are edible basically. Basically, <laughs> apple and cherry uh, and hawthorn they're all related and they're all in the rosaceae family. And the rose family has a lot of cyanide, and you've heard about that from apples and apple and you seeds. Can smell it. it, smells like uh, almonds, yeah, almondy. So, generally, one of the thumb, rules of thumb in foraging is if it smells like almonds, leave it alone because it probably got cyanide in. You can have a couple of apple blossoms or cherry blossoms on a cake or something. Mm. And actually, in Japan, they do lacto ferment or salt ferment. Yeah, lacto ferment um, the, cherry blossoms. Compounds. So, when we make also, we, we do make syrups and things. And when we make something with hawthorn blossom, for instance, we're tincturing it or we're putting it in hot water and tea. And a lot of these compounds are really, really unstable. So, as soon as you heat them, um, ferment them, uh, put alcohol on them, it breaks down the cyanide. Cyanogenic glycosides, which <laughs> is basically glycoside. precursor to cyanide. So basically, don't have lots. You can't really use them for anything and medicinally, for sure, but you could ha have a couple of sprinkles of the flowers on a salad to look pretty, but you don't want to eat, be eating lots and lots. But you can look up the Japanese fermented cherry blossoms if you're interested in that, mm. um, and use it in that way or just use it as a nice decoration. Um, so, but yeah, it's a good question, because it's a shame that we don't really eat them so much, but that's why <laughs> sorry i'm just saying everyone's saying thank you and goodbye i'm sorry yep. we were so flappy we're gonna do this again uh seasonally for you guys um yeah we'll be less flappy next time now we know now we know how to do it. <laughs> all right thank you very much for coming and we'll see you all sorry that we couldn't see your faces time. back maybe we'll do soon oh, next also, time <laughs> um yeah so we'll see you soon see ya thanks for joining bye, bye. i don't know how to end it all right just follow us around for the rest of our lives <laughs> How do, how do I end this? Come on, I'm about, to, I'm about to go have a shout. Are you still on it? Can you hear the woodpecker?